Hello everyone. As you already know, this is Jared Taylor from the Biology 112 teaching team here at UBC. Today, I would like to introduce you to the nucleic acids. But first, let's do our usual ritual of starting with a question. How? How do cells store their important information? By information, we mean all the instructions on how to make and do all of the things that cells need to make and do. More details on what exactly that information is and how it is used will be the topic of a future video. For now, let's talk about the physical manifestation of that information, which is, surprise, surprise, nucleic acids. In order to talk about this latest macromolecule, which is the last you will meet here in Biology 112, we must first talk about the monomer subunits used to build nucleic acids. These monomers are known as nucleotides and the basic structure is shown here. Actually, there are two basic forms of the monomer that are almost exactly the same. Both contain a ribose sugar group, a phosphate group, at least one hydroxyl group, and a nucleobase, which is also referred to as a nitrogenous base. In fact, ribonucleotides and deoxyribonucleotides only differ by a single group. Ribonucleotides contain an extra hydroxyl group that is missing in deoxyribonucleotides. This difference might seem small, but it actually has a huge impact. I will talk about that shortly, so for now let's talk about the features of the nucleotides themselves. Nucleotides differ in their base group, and for each basic type of nucleotide there are four possible bases. Let's start with the deoxyribonucleotides since they are more well known. Each deoxyribonucleotide uses one of four bases, adenine, thymine, guanine, and cytosine. These are usually referred to simply as A, T, G, and C. Ribonucleotides use the same bases with one exception. Instead of thymine, uracil is used, otherwise known simply as U. So that is the two types of nucleotides. They seem similar, but how they are used by the cell is significantly different. Ribonucleotides are the monomers used to build ribonucleic acids, better known as RNA. On the other hand, deoxyribonucleotides are used to form RNA's much more famous sibling, deoxyribonucleic acid, better known as DNA. As is often the case for sugar-based molecules, we use a numbering system to describe the nucleotide structures. Here, each of the sugar carbon atoms is numbered and tagged with a prime symbol. Thus, we have the one prime to five prime carbon atoms in the sugar groups. With this numbering system, we can highlight the important features properly. Each type of nucleotide has a five prime phosphate, a three prime hydroxyl, and a one prime nucleobase. The two prime carbon is of course the point of difference as I mentioned earlier, with ribonucleotides containing the extra two prime hydroxyl. Okay, let's now talk about the structure of the nucleic acid macromolecules, and for this I will start with RNA. The ribonucleotide monomers are connected by linking the 3' hydroxyl oxygen to the 5' phosphate on the next monomer. This linkage is known as a phosphodiester bond. Like other macromolecules that you have seen, the monomers are connected in the same orientation. This gives the nucleic acid some important features. The RNA chain has a series of phosphate groups that give the entire molecule an overall negative ionic charge. The sugars and phosphates together are known as the sugar phosphate backbone, with the nucleobases sticking out from this backbone. Finally, the RNA chain has distinct ends. One end has an unused 5' phosphate, while the other has an unused 3' hydroxyl. So that is RNA. The only other thing to mention is that RNA generally exists as a single chain, unlike its big brother, DNA. Also, the order of bases along the RNA represents its code. More accurately, the order of the A's, U's, G's, and C's in the RNA chain represents the important information, but that is a topic for a future video. I mentioned DNA a moment ago, so let's talk about it. The structure of a single DNA chain is the same as what we just saw for RNA, except of course the lack of the two prime hydroxyl groups and the use of T instead of U. However, the really big difference is that DNA exists as a double strand, 
with two chains of DNA interacting with each other. Critically, the two chains of DNA, or strands as we usually call them, run anti-parallel to each other. This means that the two strands run in different 5' prime to 3' prime directions. When the two strands of DNA interact, the phosphates of the backbones are on the outside of the double strand, while the bases interact with each other between the strands using non-covalent interactions. These bases, interacting in sequential pairs, are critical for both the DNA structure and its function as an information storage system, so we need to look at them in more detail. As we have already seen, there are four distinct bases used in DNA, shown here with a bit more detail to their structures. Within DNA molecules, the bases pair up in an extremely specific manner. As you likely already know, G and C form a base pair, as do A and T. For simplicity, let me show the two base pairs like this going forward. Please note that the white dashed lines represent the connections to the sugar phosphate backbones. One of the really interesting things about the structure of DNA is that when the bases pair up properly, the two strands twist around each other along the entire length of the chains. This results in the well-known double-stranded helix. We will discuss details about the double-stranded helix during Biology 112 lecture, but let me highlight one important feature here. If you look closely at the structure shown on the screen, you can see that the two backbones are farther apart along one groove of the twist than the other. Why is that true? Well, to answer that, let's take a closer look at a base pair, and for no particular reason I will choose the AT base pair located here in the helix. Let's look straight down the long axis of the helix at this base pair. Notice the point at which the bases are attached to the sugar phosphate backbone. The two connection points are not 180 degrees across from each other, but rather closer together on one side than the other. This means that if we draw an imaginary circle around the base pair, the distance between the sugar groups is shorter on one side than the other. The result of this is that as the two DNA strands twist around each other, the backbones are always closer together on one side of the helix than the other. This creates two grooves of different sizes that run the entire length of the DNA helix. These grooves are referred to as the minor groove and the major groove. These grooves give DNA certain structural benefits that cells take advantage of. This is especially true for the major groove, and we will discuss these structural advantages during Biology 112 lecture. We will also discuss several other important structural features of DNA during lecture, such as base stacking along the helix. But for now, I should wrap this video up since I've been talking for quite a while. Admittedly, I didn't really answer the original question of how cells store their information, although understanding the structure of nucleic acids is indeed the first step towards that. That larger topic spans a number of weeks here in Biology 112, and so I will return to these concepts in future videos.